That was great. So hopefully you all can see my screen. I'm going to talk uh, this afternoon about hurricane hazards and a little bit about the 2020 season. And then we'll have some emergency management speakers uh, later on that will talk a lot about preparedness. So for those of us that have lived in southeast Texas for a little while, uh, we know every storm is different. Hurricane Ike uh, was a lot different than Harvey, uh, which was a little bit different than Imelda. They were all very impactful storms. But all of these uh, storms, which we call tropical cyclones, whether it be a hurricane or tropical storm, contain some combination of these hazards, damaging winds, storm surge flooding, flooding rains, and tornadoes. Some combination of that. So we all know how different uh, Ike was than Harvey, for example. And Chambers County was uh, impacted by all of these. Uh, you know, Alicia, Ike, Harvey, uh, and then Imelda uh, just uh, last year. So anyway, some combination of these hazards. We can also add high surf and rip currents at the beaches. Uh, that's another uh, very important hazard with these storms. So which is the most dangerous hazard? Well, a lot of people uh, think hurricanes, they think of the high winds, but it's actually the water-related hazards. Storm surge, flooding from rain uh, account for almost 90% uh, of fatalities, uh, actually closer to uh, 80%. So uh, that's really uh, what's the most dangerous. That's why if we have a situation where we expect storm surge pushing into the jurisdictions here like Chambers or uh, Baytown, we, we, we want to get people out of there. And the judge is going to make that call or, or the mayors. But on that pie chart, you can see what type of hazard is responsible for deaths in tropical cyclones. And about half storm surge, about a quarter uh, flooding from rain, and then wind, 8%, tornadoes 3%, so much lower. Uh, these are all dangerous, but it really is the water-related hazards that are the most deadly. Now there's a bar chart on the right that says, if there is a tropical cyclone, what percentage of those have a fatality from the different hazards? And so the way to interpret that is about half of these storms have at least one rain-related fatality. Storm surge, only about one in 10 have those, but when they do occur, they can be in large numbers. And it's not just uh, hurricane direct impacts. Uh, we've got to remember um, there could be indirect fatalities too, things like heart attacks. There's always a bump in those, uh, both before, during, and after the storm. There's a lot of stress, uh, both physical and mental stress. So we have to remember to kind of you know take it easy, take it slow. Uh, don't overexert if we can help it. Carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, fires, uh, including fires from candlelight, um, more traffic accidents. You know, there's a lot of debris in the road typically. So these are things we don't always think about with hurricanes, but sure enough, uh, they're an important part of it. Uh, if you all remember Hurricane Rita, uh, there were actually more indirect fatalities than there were direct uh, from the evacuation uh, in that case. So let's talk now about the different parts of the hurricane. I can tell you, I came to the Houston Galveston office in 2008, just in time uh, to experience Hurricane Ike. And sure enough, uh, Chambers County, Mount Bellevue, uh, even Baytown, they caught some of the worst of this particular storm. So what are we looking at here? This is a radar image. The blue uh, area in the center, that's the eye. That's where there's no rain and there's light winds in the eye of the storm. But it's very important to know that that ring around the eye called the eye wall, that's where the highest winds are in the hurricane. The absolute highest winds typically on the right-hand side of the eye wall. So where is that? That's Chambers County. Chambers, Jefferson, Liberty County uh, caught really the highest winds that Hurricane Ike had to offer and of course, some of the worst storm surge. So again, you get those high winds in the eye wall. You also have spiral bands. Uh, I've kind of outlined those in red there off to the right of the center track. And in those, you can get tornadoes, gusty winds, and very heavy rain. So uh, those are a few parts of the storm. 
In general, all those hazards we talked about are just a bit worse on the right-hand side of the track. And so sometimes you'll hear about the dirty side of the storm, and that's why that, that's where that name came from. So let's talk about the different hazards. Hurricane winds. Uh, these are pictures from Hurricane Michael, uh, which impacted the Florida Panhandle a couple years ago. We, we rate the uh, wind part of the storm using something called the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale. So you hear this on the news, uh, you know, what category is the storm? Is it a one, two, three, four, five? And we saw with Hurricane Ike, some people were saying, oh, it's just a category two. And we were really concerned because look at the numbers here, category two, sustained winds, 96 to 110 miles per hour. And also Ike was huge. It was a huge category two, so it had just really devastating storm surge. And we sort of felt like not everybody understood that. So the category, what is it? It's just about the wind threat. And even a low category is really severe winds. Uh, you know, just last night, uh, we had Isaias uh, hitting North Carolina and working its way up the East Coast. It was a category one. Uh, but it was enough to do a lot of damage. So that's that's the uh, Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale. Again, it's a wind damage scale. And there's a link there if you'd like to explore it a little bit more. So let's talk about a high category landfall like Hurricane Harvey. Now for us, Hurricane Harvey was all about the flooding rains. But if you were down in the uh, mid-Texas coast, down Rockport, down that area, it was all about very high winds and storm surge. So what are we looking at in this radar image here? This is the eye wall of Hurricane Harvey, a category four at landfall. Very, very strong winds. You can see the eye in the satellite image here, just a really frightening looking storm. And so for them, it was all about those high winds and storm surge. And so here's some of the imagery from the Rockport area. So if you get a if we do get a high category landfall, a direct hit uh, from a Cat three or four, for example, then we are going to be concerned about wind damage, like we see uh, in the pictures here. Uh, some homes very severely damaged, like you might see with a tornado. Notice also, though, in the background, there are some homes that withstood those winds, and they were measured 135 to 150 miles per hour. So very significant winds and uh, it's been a while since we've had a direct hit from a high category storm don't hope to see that anytime soon but if we do have that situation we do need to be concerned about the wind hazard water hazards uh, rainfall and storm surge flooding uh, like i said these are the most deadly hazards uh, you know we have more than our share of experience with all of both of these uh, in the last uh, 12 years and certainly even in the last three years. So Hurricane Harvey, as the Congressman said, uh, this was a record setting rainfall for us. And uh, you can see, hopefully you can see the image there, the, the uh, movie loop showing the hurricane making landfall. Now look at the spiral bands over our area. This, it was the spiral bands that gave us the heavy rain, not the center of the storm. And you can see that very well in this radar loop. You know, rain rates three, four, five inches an hour or more sitting over the area for extended periods of time for multiple nights. So uh, this was the record setting rainfall for any tropical cyclone in the U.S. And unfortunately, we were right in the middle of it. Uh, now, if you look at the track on the right, you see how the storm came in, it kind of stalled out and then looped back and moved slowly over the area. I want you to remember that a slow moving tropical cyclone, you've got to always be concerned about flooding rains. Uh, we saw this with Imelda as well, and then with Allison uh, many years ago. So as I said, this was a record setter as far as rainfall goes, but it also impacted a very large area. You see this map here, all those areas in dark blue, including uh, the jurisdictions we have on this afternoon, had greater than 50, that's 5-0, inches of rain over a three to four day period. 
And that small little white dot there is near Nederland where they had over 60 inches of rain. So there's never been this, all these observations just blew apart the record. Um, and not only, it's not just one spot, it's several counties that had these just, you know, tremendous amounts of rainfall. So it's no surprise uh, we had the flooding that we did. So, uh, you know, we figure that's, you know, a 500 year storm. You get these about once every 500 years, a storm like Harvey. Well, what happens? We actually get Imelda a few years later. And that's what I'm showing on this slide. Uh, tropical storm Imelda. It came up. You can see that swirl there making a landfall there around Galveston. But notice again, it's banding around the center. It's not the center of the storm itself. And when you get a spiral band that sits over one area, that's when you get into trouble. And so look at the rainfall map for Imelda. On the left side, Chambers was right in the middle of it. Uh, Imelda impacted a smaller area than Harvey. But where it hit, it hit very, very hard, just as hard as Harvey, uh, with over 40 inches of rain falling over a shorter period of time. So in this case, Chambers all the way over toward Beaumont and then up into Liberty County uh, had the worst of it. Notice the track of Imelda, once again, slow moving and looping. And that's kind of the recipe for us to get feet of rain. Hurricane Ike, uh, Chambers County, once again, uh, right in the heart of the worst of this hurricane back in 2008. Now watch, this is a lot different than Harvey. Ike is gonna come steadily through and keep on moving. So we didn't really have a tremendous amount of rainfall, but what we did have is a lot of water getting pushed up onto land. A large category two hurricane was actually forecast to be a category three, it was just you know, a few miles per hour short of a three. So, uh, and you can see the center there coming right over Galveston Bay and that put Chambers uh, in Liberty um, and even Southeast Harris right in the middle of that storm. And so big hurricanes, big tropical storms generate a lot of storm surge. And that's of course what we saw with Hurricane Ike. Uh, here are some photographs from uh, Galveston Notice the uh, big surf being created by the storm as it's approaching the coast, uh, hitting the seawall there. I want you to look at the lower left there. That's an important photograph. This is about 12 hours before the winds started to pick up. But by then, the water had already risen so much that people on Bolivar uh, could not get out. So some people were planning to evacuate. They waited till Friday morning when the storm was due to come in late Friday night and it was too late. So there were actually hundreds of people that had to be taken off that area by boat and by helicopter. What, is, what does this mean for us? If, if you're in a surge zone, be sure to leave early enough because that water is gonna start to rise, uh, in some cases 24 hours or more before the winds arrive. And here's uh, Bolivar Peninsula after Ike, of course, beforehand, full of homes, uh, vegetation afterward, pretty much swept clear. Uh, that's rollover pass in the foreground. Where did this debris end up? Of course, a lot of it ended up in Chambers County uh, in those debris piles. Uh, so it's just nothing you want to uh, go through. You know, you certainly don't want to be uh, on Bolivar Peninsula in this case. Uh, with all that power of the storm surge coming in and out. Now, what's kind of uh, interesting with Hannah this year, uh, you'll see the radar loop from Hannah in the lower right. Uh, notice the center makes landfall well down the coast, down into South Texas. Uh, the Congressman alluded to this, uh, but notice even in the case of Hannah being so far south, we actually got some storm surge impacts on our coastline as well. Uh, the photograph uh, from the upper left is from the beach at Sargent, Texas, uh, down toward Matagorda Bay. Uh, and you can see all the debris that got pushed up, ocean debris that got pushed up onto the beach. Uh, the impacts from Hannah, nothing like Ike, of course, but there, 
there certainly were tidal impacts all the way up through Galveston Bay as well. Uh, there were some low-lying areas that flooded. So keep in mind that anywhere near or to the right of the track, you can get those surge impacts. So it's important to know if you're at risk for storm surge flooding. And so it all boils down to what's your land elevation. Uh, if you're fairly low, your elevation, and the water level is higher than your land elevation, you're liable to get storm surge flooding. And so what this map is on the right is a ground elevation map. And you can see the scale there. Uh, so all those areas in green are less than 10 feet uh, above sea level. And then you see some blue areas, too, that are uh, even uh, shallower, uh, more like uh, five feet or less. And, and, and then the reds, when you get up to the reds, now we're looking at 25 feet or so. So that's a bit higher. That's harder for the surge to reach. So um, keep that in mind. Uh, the lower elevation areas on this map are the most vulnerable. And that includes much of Chambers County, uh, portions of Baytown, especially down near the water. Uh, Mount Bellevue is a bit higher, but with uh, Trinity Bay and, and some of the other inlets uh, pushing through into that area, you can get some surge impacts as well. And, you know, Ike was a big test of that. You know, Ike pushed a surge into the bay of 10 to 13 feet and uh, flooded a lot of those areas you see uh, in yellow and green and blue. Now, I want you to take a quick look at the evacuation zone map for the region and compare it to this elevation map and you're gonna see they look kind of similar, especially the greens, yellows, and purples uh, line up with these lower elevation areas. And that's because the evacuation maps are based in part on the storm surge threat. Now, there's a really great website that we're gonna share with y'all. Uh, you don't have to write this down. We'll send this website out after the webinar. Um, and you can kind of zoom in on your area and see, well, if I do get a storm, how bad could it get uh, for my area? And you could do that uh, for uh, worst case category one all the way up to category five. And it will show you, again, a worst case for depth of water above ground. So here's a worst case category one. Category two, now all those areas in red are greater than nine feet above ground level. Category three. Category four, and then God forbid, a category five. So uh, again, this is kind of a worst case, but it gives you an idea of what your risk is in your area. So uh, let's go back to a category three worst case. You can see for that kind of major hurricane, probably a large category three, what areas might end up being flooded. Uh, if we look at the worst case category two, that actually kind of looks like um, our Hurricane Ike flooding locally. So this is something you can do to assess the risk of your home or business uh, to storm surge flooding. Uh, the good news is if you're not in a shaded area, storm surge is not a big concern for you. But for the folks on this call, very many of you, uh, especially if you're in the lower end of the county, uh, have a concern for storm surge. Tornadoes and water spouts, uh, this is one of the hazards we haven't talked about. And where do the tornadoes occur? Quite often in those spiral bands. So take a look at the radar picture here of Harvey. You can see down near Cuero, the uh, center of circulation, Gonzales there, Victoria. But what's what stands out is these spiral bands that are pivoting up into our area here in Southeast Texas. And these spiral bands, they contain very heavy rain and some rotating thunderstorms, many producing tornadoes. Uh, here's a photograph of one in the Cypress area that Harvey produced. The map in the upper right in red shows all the, uh, the Harvey tornadoes. So there was a bunch. There were 22 or 23 uh, in our area alone. And then uh, just last night, uh, we had another hurricane, of course, not in our area, but uh, moving up through North Carolina, um, I saw just an hour ago, it was just west of New York City uh, and produced a 70 mile per hour wind at the New York City airport. So uh, here's uh, a hurricane, uh, Isaias, very hard for me to pronounce that, Isaias. And uh, 
But look at those features we talked about earlier. You see the swirl near the center, and look at the spiral bands on the right-hand side. And what happened? Well, they, there was a lot of high winds. And look at all the, the red T's on my map on the left here. These are all tornadoes. Uh, there were actually a dozen more uh, that have showed up since then. So once again, tornadoes in the bands on the right-hand side of the track. Uh, that tends to be very favorable. And it was, again, with this storm, as it was with Harvey. So uh, now if we've talked about the hurricanes and hurricane hazards, let's talk now about how to stay informed. It's important during the hurricane season to know what's going on out there. You can see some websites here. Uh, Hurricanes.gov is the National Hurricane Center website. Weather Service Houston is weather.gov slash Houston. And then your uh, local office of emergency management you know, they have great websites, great social media. So it's important to be plugged into all those things. Now, if you go to hurricanes.gov, the first thing I would take a look at is this two-day tropical weather outlook. You'll see it right on the front page. And what it will do is it will show you any storms that are out there already. And uh, you can see, in this case, Isaias off the uh, Florida coast. And, and this is a, a few. This is just uh, yesterday, actually. And then there was another disturbance with this orange X here that the Hurricane Center felt had a 40% chance of becoming the J storm, you know, the next tropical cyclone. And then there's a five-day version of it. It says, well, where might that development occur in the next five days? And so that disturbance at the orange X has a, it turns out, a 60% chance of developing into something in the next five days. Notice the direction as well, not a threat to Texas. Uh, likely if it were to develop, it would stay offshore. But this is, again, something you can check in with every day. Uh, just imagine if this development area were over the Gulf, then we would really want to sit up and take notice uh, because we may have something develop close to our coastline. The forecast cone, uh, what does that mean? Well, uh, you can see on the upper center part of the frame here, this is the forecast cone for Harvey. And what it means is the center should track within that cone two thirds of the time. All right. And also along with that, it will track outside the cone about one third of the time, but it gives you an idea of the uncertainty in the track based on past errors. So, you know, when we see this forecast, we figure, okay, well, that center is probably gonna track somewhere uh, between, um, you know, Galveston Bay all the way down to the Mexican border. That's the most likely track of the center. And Harvey actually tracked pretty close to the center of that cone. So that, that forecast was, was pretty accurate. And you could see uh, how different Isaias cone looks from yesterday. See how it's all strung out and long. That's because this thing is moving so fast um, that it, it, it looks different. But again, it's a forecast cone um, nonetheless. Uh, but it is not an impacts cone. Let's say, for example, we have a storm like Carla making landfall down the coast, our area would probably be outside the, the cone, but you know we would get tremendous impacts. So don't let your guard down if you're not inside the cone. It doesn't mean you won't be impacted. Wind probabilities, uh, this is something that uh, we put in our briefings and on our website. And basically it just tells you where the greatest chances are for tropical storm winds, or uh, 58 mile per hour winds or even hurricane force winds. And so it allows you to, to get a better sense, better than the cone, of how bad the winds could be. So these are the wind probabilities. Also, uh, you know, your emergency managers, your judge, your mayor, they're gonna wanna know when the tropical storm force winds will arrive and so this is something we present to them as well. Uh, in this case, you, you might ask, when will the tropical storm force winds arrive on the North Carolina coast? Uh, you go to the left-hand side, it says, well, they'll most likely arrive uh, Monday night, last night. 
uh, say, you know, 10 or 11 p.m., but they could arrive as early as um, early evening. So that's how to interpret these, these charts. And you can actually combine the two. So this is actually Hannah uh, from uh, just a couple weeks ago. And you can see Tropical Storm Hannah. Where are the Tropical Storm Force winds likely to be? Down the coast with all these bright colors. What about our area? No, very, very low tropical storm uh, wind probability. So that tells us that wind is not really a concern for HANA. And then if you're on the uh, in the coastal bend or South Texas coast, it tells you that those high winds will likely arrive around 2 p.m. Saturday. And then uh, finally, uh, we mentioned storm surge is a big concern. The National Hurricane Center, when the surge is about 48 hours out, will produce maps like this one Telling, telling us how deep the water could potentially get. And of course, for many of us here, 48 hours, by that time, decisions are already being made. So, um, you know, at the Weather Service Houston, we're gonna try to give you an idea, even before these are generated, how bad the surge can be. But still, this can be a useful map for us. And then storm surge watches and warnings. Uh, this is relatively new. Uh, we didn't have this when uh, when Hurricane Ike came through. There was no such thing as a storm surge warning. Uh, but since then, given that storm surge is so dangerous, a separate watch and warning was created uh, to kind of highlight areas where life-threatening surge may be. Finally, uh, what is the forecast for this year? Well, you know, we, we're off to a very fast start. We've already had nine named storms. Uh, you know, by the end of July, we had nine named storms. That's never happened before. And so, uh, you know, the forecast of a couple months ago was for an above act, uh, above normal season, and we're certainly well on our way for that. Uh, might be interesting, you know, if we kept at this pace, it's even possible we could run out of names. And then what happens then? Well, then the Greek alphabet would be used. So we could have like a hurricane alpha or beta or gamma. That's only happened one other time in 2005, but um, nonetheless, uh, it could happen this year. We're, we're on our way to a very active season, it seems. And so the last thing I want to mention to y'all is to follow trusted sources. You know, nowadays, um, you know, you can get all kinds of information like on the Internet or social media, and you might only be able to believe maybe half of it at most. So I really encourage you to follow the National Weather Service. Uh, you know, the local stations do a good job as far as the weather and also your, your Office of Emergency Management for your jurisdiction. They're going to give you the best kind of uh, advice from uh, trusted sources. And we do have a hurricane guide with a lot more information that's linked here. And we will send you, the, you all that link um, after the uh, presentations. So I think uh, that's all I have. Um, I think what I would like to do is take questions at the end, uh, and for now I'm going to turn it over to Baytown and uh, Jamie Galloway, and he's going to uh, become the presenter and, and talk a little bit about uh, preparedness. Okay, I'm going to uh, actually, all right, I see what's going on. I'm going to make... Uh, I'll make Ryan the presenter because I think Jamie's connected by audio only. Correct. That's correct, Dan. I can All right. hear you and I can see the screen, but uh, I could not log in as an organizer. All right. So, Ryan, you're now, uh, you've got the controls. There you go. Yep. And uh, and we'll go ahead and uh, start with the emergency yep. management. Thank you all. All right. Thanks. I'm Jamie Galloway. I'm the emergency management coordinator for the city of Baytown. Uh, with me in, in our room is uh, David Alameda, our Deputy Emergency Management Coordinator. And we'll talk a little bit about COVID-19 and hurricane season. It's going to be a lot different. And we'll talk mostly on the first slide about uh, evacuation. And I know some of the other jurisdictions have things in, in their presentations about evacuation too. Next slide, Ryan. Here you go. Uh, hurricanes during pandemic, you know, this is going to be a new thing for everybody. 
if you're going to have to evacuate, you need to plan for things that relate to the pandemic. You know, add to your your uh, hurricane kits, masks uh, or face coverings, gloves, hand sanitizer, if you can disinfect it, wipes and thermometers to your emergency kits. You might you're going to need to update your evacuation and transportation plans to include uh, more time and plan for any place you may stop that you're going to have social distance. Now, some people may be going have a designated place for going to. You need to look at that ahead of time and see what kind of uh, maybe local orders they have in place for social distancing, mask, and and, and those type of things, um, and plan extra time. I couldn't tell you how much more time. My suggestion is up to 12 hours more than you normally would use. Um, if you know elderly folks and both in any vulnerable population, help them get food, medicine, medical supplies, and any evacuation assistance. And we'll talk about uh, the state program in a little bit. Uh, identify a safe place to evacuate outside the hurricane uh, prone areas to limit the need for shelters. We've been on calls with the state. Uh, uh, the mass care coordinator about the way some of this is going to be done. Uh, in the past, everybody went to, a, if you were on an embarkation hub, you got on a bus and you went to a shelter area, uh, they would put you in a, in a shelter at that, at that location. The state is looking at other options this time, maybe using college dorms, using campgrounds, using uh, uh, hotels. As part of the con as part of the sheltering operation this this go round, I know they ran some tests with the Red Cross uh, during the Alaska tornadoes to see how that worked. Uh, the feeding would be different. There wouldn't be any congregate uh, feeding or buffet top lines. Everything would be separate. There's some things the state is currently working on. Um, traditional shelters, as I mentioned, may not be available. Uh, they're, they're, the state's looking at a lot of different things. We're looking at some things locally. Uh, hotels, motels, dorms to limit exposure. And as you know, you know, it's getting out of the, out of the surge prone area and the high wind area is the reason we evacuate here. But with Hurricane Harvey, we really weren't affected by the surge or by the by the winds. We had rain and that, that created what was needed as a, a, a flood shelter. And we, we've already taken some precautions uh, here in the city and looked at our sheltering plans for those type of things. We were looking at it during Hurricane And we will have to separate any cots. We're going to have to be separated six feet. We're using the Red Cross guidelines and the CDC guidelines when we get ready to set up a shelter. Uh, I mentioned know the local public health control measures in place. Uh, you know, I travel, I've got a place up in the hill country and, and I look before I go up there because if I stop in Travis County or Bastrop County or Hayes County, they all have different orders in place than, than, than we do here in Harrison Chambers County. Um, it be doing health screenings and temperature checks. Uh, we'll do that for shelter, uh, sheltering operations in the here and now. Uh, when we get ready to, uh, if we have a mass evacuation, we operating our embarkation hub here in Baytown where we bring the state buses in to evacuate folks. We will do a screening there. We'll do temperature checks and, and go through that process uh, that the state and the CDC and the Red Cross has set up. Uh, if you're going to stay at home, take the time to strengthen your home from storms. I know Ryan's got a few slides in his presentation about about doing things uh, of that nature. Hey, next slide, Ryan. Here you go. Uh, the state program uh, registering with STEER. It is a state of Texas emergency assistant registry. Uh, Folks can register for that by calling 211 and giving them the information. This was a program that was set up a lot after Rita and enhanced after Hurricane Ike. Uh, for those who need assistance in, in, in evacuating uh, hurricane areas, uh, we have embarkation hubs that we'll set up. We'll have one here in Baytown on North Main Street at, at Second Baytown at the church there. Uh, Pasadena and a lot of jurisdictions along the 225 corridor use the uh, Pasadena uh, Convention Center 
and we, we request the buses in, we'll do that. People will come in, they get there, we'll do the screening, we'll, we'll issue some armbands, we'll get you registered, and then you'll get on the uh, state buses to be taken out of the area to the shelter locations. And there's, the state was still reviewing a lot of those things uh, as to where they were gonna send people and, and how they were gonna set up any, any sheltering operations. And we mentioned that they're looking at hotels and college dorms and those type of things. So they're still in the process of finalizing that. I know down in, during Hurricane Hannah, there were some of the re reports I read, I don't think they did a mass bus evacuation, but they did prep uh, several shelters down there for flooding operations. And they had one that was what, that was just specifically set up for anybody that may had COVID-19 symptoms. So they had, a, they had that plan already in place down there. And we're doing the same thing here. The, uh, one thing with the with the state of Texas emergency assistant registry, you have to register every year. Uh, they kind of purge the uh, the database every every December or January. Once somebody registers, the local emergency management coordinator can log into that site, and we can get that information, and we can see who's who is in, who is registered for the system, and who's going to need assistance. We know if they're going to need some type of medical attention, if they're going to have pets. They're going to have additional family members with them, and if uh, they're going to need some type of special care, so we can look at that those items in 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 advance. We'll work on our side. We'll if the Harris County side, we we'll work at Harris County Emergency Management. We'll work with Ryan and Chambers County as well. If we see something on there that we may need assistance with, and we'll get all that congregated because before. We get ready to pull them the trigger on an embarkation hub. We need to look at all this data, see what we have, and make those requests to the state so we can get get our resources down here to help uh, the residents evacuate that need it. But make sure that this is done every year. If you're already registered, register again. We take that database information, and we plot it on a map. We've actually have it plotted here where we can see who's in a surge zone that's registered and who's in what which flood zone. And we've even taken it and, and lined it up with uh, the Harris County transit bus routes over here to see the most populated areas near the bus routes and identified school locations where we can have one area in each area, a pickup location, then transport them over to the embarkation hub. So we're looking at ways to, to help get people to the site a little bit easier. Okay, next slide, Ryan. State informing, Dan mentioned it. You know, use trusted news sources. Uh, we see a lot of different things. I even look on social media when, when we get a storm approaching and there's all kinds of hurricane sites that crop up. And if you read two or three of them, they all have storms going to different places. But we, we maintain uh, a lot of contact with the National Weather Service here when this is all going on so we can uh, stay informed. I'll, the city will be posting information on their, their uh, website, www baytown.org, the uh, City Hall Facebook page and the Baytown Fire Facebook page, City of Baytown Twitter. And we use the SWIFT 911 mass notification system. Uh, you can register, but uh, if you're not already, SWIFT 911 to that number, 99538. And you can receive text messages, emails, and phone calls on any information that's being pushed out. One thing about this, this soft, what I like about the program, is if you're evacuated and we push the call out, you're still gonna get the call about what's going on here. If we say, okay, it's safe to return, we'll push a call out. Uh, the other thing is, is if you're in different parts of the state and other jurisdictions use this program, which I know Galveston does and some other ones, you can subscribe through the app to their notification system so you can get notifications from them as well. Um, and then we also have, in Baytown, we have, uh, AM radio station, <coughs> 1610 AM. It's our alert AM radio. We just did some upgrades to it not uh, late, late last year. We'll push messages out on that as, as we need to. It's currently tied into the uh, National Weather Service NOAA weather radio. So if they push an alert out, it automatically gets overridden on the message that's on the system now. So it'll override that and that message will go out. Uh, one thing about the SWIFT 911, we've also gone in and done some work with that where we have tied it into our, our outdoor warning sirens. 
uh, zone. So if we have a chemical emergency and we push uh, that sirens alerted, it automatically dials those those phone numbers uh, and, and pushes out a message of a chemical emergency it, that's in that zone. And when we also take that that system and we enter everybody that registered through uh, the state steer system that's in our in our uh, responsibility area of responsibility, we put those in there so we push out one message to everybody if we have to notify steer registrants that we're going to do an evacuation. That's all I have, Ryan. Uh, and like Dan said, we'll hold questions till the end. All right, next up, uh, Jeff and Lee with the city of Mount Bellevue. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, just to kind of reiterate uh, what they were saying, I'll, I'll go through uh, our information systems and what we've done for our city. But first off, my name is Lee Atchison. I'm the Director of Emergency Services for the City of Mont Bellevue, also serving as the EMC. Uh, here with me is Jeffrey Schott, who serves as the Deputy Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Mont Bellevue. Our hurricane preparedness uh, and, and what we've done over the last year and a half uh, to get our systems up to uh, par for our citizens is uh, we've updated our siren system. So can you switch slides, Ryan? Uh, we'll start with our Mont Bellevue info source, which is Enforce. Uh, if you take your phone, you can actually uh, scan the app with your camera and it'll pop up. You can click on and register uh, in, in the Mont Bellevue Enforce program. With the Mont Bellevue Enforce program, to receive the same notifications as you would in Baytown. Swift Reach or Swift 911, we operate under the new system, which is the RAVE system. They're all the same system, such as the county uh, system that they op operate under in Chambers 1. Uh, it allows you to receive these notifications for evacuations, um, storm notifications, and even with industrial accidents, we can make notifications for shelter in place and things of that nature. Along the same lines, we worked really hard, especially our, our Deputy Emergency Management Coordinator this past year, to become storm ready. Uh, with the notification systems, we also have a weather station. We broadcast it on, our, on the city's Facebook page uh, to where you can watch live satellites and live feed of our live camera at uh, the intersection of Eagle Drive and 565. Uh, with that storm ready certification, it ensures through the National Weather Service that we've met certain criteria uh, to make sure that we are getting our information pushed out to our citizens in a timely manner so they can make decisions for their family and themselves. Next slide, please. Uh, additional location you, you can get uh, from our city's Facebook page, uh, the Mont Bellevue Fire Department or the uh, Mont Bellevue Police Department's Facebook page. And it's about staying aware local news media, uh, they'll have live radar, the National Weather Service, Dan is real good about pushing information out to us so we can share that information with you timely. Next slide. And we'll talk a little bit about our sirens. So also over the past year, our sirens have been updated to where uh, we receive automatic notifications or our citizens can receive automatic notifications if you're within this zone. So as soon as a tornado warning uh, is included in any portion of the zone, the sirens will automatically sound. We manually set as a test every Wednesday at four o'clock. However, in the event of inclement weather during that time period, we will not set the sirens off. We will leave it uh, to ensure that if a tornado enters into that area or the watch enters in, into, or warning, excuse me, enters into that area, that our citizens be notified, as well as uh, a Mont Bellevue enforced push out and a Facebook push out by our PO, um, Brian Lee. Next. Some of the important numbers, of course, 911. Uh, uh, Chief Galloway mentioned uh, for Baytown, the steer program, we want to ensure that everyone is everyone who needs to be registered is registered so we can make our decisions based off your needs. 
uh, Chambers County OEM, and of course, uh, City of Mont Bellevue, uh, fire and police, uh, our non-emergency numbers. If you need additional assistance, you can call those as well. And that's pretty much all we have. We'll pass it on to Ryan at the county. Okay, thank you, Lee. So I'll go through these. Uh, uh, we have a few slides here to share with you about preparing. And so we'll start a little bit about preparing your home. So some things you can keep in mind to prepare your home. You know, you need to have a plan in place to do that. Uh, boarding up windows is probably one of the most important things, uh, as, as well as bracing garage doors. Those garage doors have a tendency to be weak and they want to uh, push in with the wind and then they want to push your roof roof up so especially uh, important you know if your house is attached to your garage uh, brace those doors on the inside other things removing any antennas or dishes that may be on the outside so that they don't harm the home or the roof or wherever they're attached uh, also if you uh, it's a good idea to turn off your gas water and electricity if you're going to be in a hard hit area or especially if you evacuate so that if damage does occur that uh, and a gas line should rupture, you're not uh, releasing that gas into the house. Uh, trampolines, they, they become projectiles. It doesn't even have to be a hurricane. We've seen these with uh, storms that were just wind generating events. Uh, good idea to have those trampolines strapped down as well as garbage cans, lawn furniture, kids toys outside, anything that could, that could blow away. Uh, an idea you could do with boats is you could place them near your home and fill them with water. Water is very heavy per gallon and so it should keep that in place. Uh, locking your windows and doors and also don't forget your pets. Bring a kennel or leash with you if you're going to leave so that uh, wherever you end up you can take care of your pet. Now we're going to go through a few evacuation tips. Uh, keeping your vehicle in good repair with a a full tank of fuel. Uh, don't wait to the last minute. If you wait till they call an ev evacuation, then everyone's going to be trying to get fuel. So try to, when it's during hurricane season, try to keep your vehicles filled up. You also may want to check on those neighbors or friends who may have any type of needs. Uh, it, it could be transportation needs. It could be medical needs. Also prepare a kit to take with you, some necessary items. Uh, maybe make a, a, a go bag where you can keep those things in there. And a warning for persons that live in mobile homes, trailers, or low-lying areas, they should leave early uh, because uh, you, you're more susceptible to the impact of the storm if you meet one of those criteria. Also, another suggestion, you could designate a meeting point for your family should you get separated. And if possible, have another form of communication, a radio, CB radio, a, family walkie-talkie or something like that. We found that during evacuations and storms, not only could things get damaged, but there are so many people using cell phones during the evacuations that all the circuits get tied up frequently and sometimes it's hard to get through. That's why you should only use the cell phones for emergencies. Also monitor your local radio and television stations who should be releasing information about the area. It's also a good idea to let someone else know uh, where you're going. Uh, also, don't take things with you you don't need. So if you don't need to bring your boat with you, don't bring your boat. You know, take what you need, you and your family. Uh, one thing we saw during Rita is, is people were, were really loaded up with unnecessary items and then they, uh, it just congested the road brings even that much more. So something to keep in mind, uh, if, a mayor or county judge asks you to evacuate, there's a reason. It's because they think it's too dangerous to stay. And also, resources may not be available to take care of you before, during, or immediately after the storm. So the storm is going to affect you, and the community is also going to affect phone lines. It's going to affect roadways. It's going to affect uh, police, fire, EMS, sheriff's office from being able to get to you. And so they may not be able to get to you. It's not that uh, we don't want to help. We may not be able to help because the storm may impact our facilities and infrastructure as well. And also remember that during the storm, when the wind reaches about 50 miles per hour or more, 
that those first responders are not allowed to respond because the wind can topple over their vehicles or blow them off the road and they won't be able to get to you. So there is actually a point uh, if you stay that, that uh, 911 will not be able to respond to your location. Don't forget about your pets. Have a kennel, a muzzle, collar, leash, and food for your pet. And it's a good idea if you can, you can take your pets with you. Uh, you should, they need to be cared for as well and uh, just remember to prepare for them. And this link down here at the bottom, www.ready.gov, they have a lot of information about preparing you and your family, uh, items you can put together for a disaster kit and so forth. It's a, it's a lot of information there that's prepared. And we have public notification systems like Baytown and Montgomery. Please register with ours if you live in the county. You go to our emergency management page and you click on this symbol that says Chambers Warns and it will guide you how to register your cell phone and your email. With so many uh, persons, myself included, moving away from land-based lines at their home and their family have cell phones, it's important that people like us register with this so that the system knows to dial you because we won't call your cell phone unless you've registered with us specifically. And Dan, back to you. All right. Do you want to do some Q&A?